Hello and welcome back. In today's video, we're overclocking the Intel Core i7-13700K processor all the way up to 6 GHz using the EK MANA MSI MAG Z690 Torpedo EKX motherboard and EK Pro Custom Loop water cooling. Raptor Lake has a lot of headroom for overclocking and performance tuning. And by using this low-end Z690 motherboard, I want to show you that you don't need an expensive Z790 motherboard to squeeze more performance out of your Raptor Lake CPU. That said, Raptor Lake overclocking doesn't come without its own challenges. And in this video, I'll try to explain you how to work around all of them. So I hope you enjoyed the video and let's get started. The Intel Core i7 is part of Intel's 13th generation Intel Core processor lineup. Intel Raptor Lake builds on top of the performance hybrid architecture introduced with the 12th gen Alder Lake. So it also features performance P cores and efficient E cores. Like Alder Lake, it is built on the Intel 7 process technology, formerly known as 10 nanometer enhanced superfit. While it may sound like Raptor Lake is not much different from its predecessor, the spec sheet reads quite impressive. Compared to the Core i7-12700K launched one year ago, the 13700K has 400MHz higher turbo boost frequency and 4 additional threads while costing $40 less. In this video we will cover 4 different overclocking strategies. First, we unleash the turbo boost limits and enable XMP 3.0. Second, we overclock using MSI Game Boost technology. Third, we overclock using MSI's turbo ratio offset feature. Lastly, we get into the manual tuning of a Raptor Lake processor. However, before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the hardware and the benchmarks that we'll be using in this guide. The system we're overclocking today consists of the following hardware. I explained how I use the Elmo Labs products in Scatterventure number 34. Basically, I connect the EFC to the EVC2 and allows me to monitor the ambient temperature, the water temperature, as well as the fan duty cycle. I include the measurements in my Prime95 stability test results. I also use the Elma Labs EFC to map the radiator fan curve to the water temperature. Without going into too many details, I've attached an external temperature sensor from the water in the loop to the EFC. Then I use the low high setting to map the fan curve from 25 to 40 degrees water temperature. I use this configuration for all overclocking strategies. The main takeaway from this configuration is that it gives us a very good indication on whether our cooling solution is saturated. Suppose the CPU is at TJ Maxx and the water temperature exceeds 40 degrees Celsius. In that case, it means the fans are at maximum speed and thus the cooling solution is saturated. Improving the cooling solution by adding radiators or changing to more powerful fans would be the right action. Suppose the CPU is at TJ Maxx and the water temperature is below 40 degrees Celsius. In that case, it means the cooling solution is not saturated. Therefore, to improve the CPU temperature, you may enhance the thermal transfer of the CPU heat into the loop by exchanging the thermal paste, delitting or changing the water block. The Z690 Torpedo EKX is the fifth collaborative motherboard of MSI and EK after the Carbon EKX versions for Z490, Z590, X570 and Z690. However, it's the first collaborative product that uses the EK Lightblock technology. I already covered quite a bit about EK Lightblock in Scatterbencher number 34, but let's have a look at the main points. The EK Lightblock sits between a regular CPU water block and a monoblock. It's not a monoblock because it doesn't directly cool the VRM of the motherboard. And it's also not quite a CPU block because it still indirectly cools the VRM. So how does it work? MSI redesigned the Z690 Torpedo VRM heatsink to feature a flat surface on both the west and north side of the heatsink. The EK light block then extends from the CPU socket over the VRM heatsink flat surface and, with the help of two thermal pads, makes contact with the VRM heatsink. The result is that even though it's not a monoblock, the light block still actively cools the VRM. If you want to learn more, I suggest you check out the EK or MSI product page. 
We use Windows 11 and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. Before we start overclocking, we must first check the performance at default settings. Please note that the Z690 Torpedo EKX by default unleashes the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits. So for us to check the stock performance of the 13700K, we must first enter the BIOS and enter the advanced mode, enter the overclocking settings menu, ensure CPU cooler tuning is set to boxed cooler, then save and exit the BIOS. The default Turbo Boost 2.0 parameters for the Core i7-13700K are as follows. Here is the benchmark performance at stock. Here are the 3DMark CPU profile scores at stock. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU peak core clock is 4975MHz and average CPU E core clock is 3801MHz with 1.141V. The average CPU temperature is 90 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.2 and 37.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 253 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5225 MHz and the average CPU E core clock is 4091 MHz with 1.222 volts. The average CPU temperature is 90 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26 and 37.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 253 watts. Now let us try our first overclocking strategy. However, before that, make sure to locate the clear CMOS pins on the motherboard. Shorting the clear CMOS pins will reset all your BIOS settings to default, which is helpful if you want to start your BIOS configuration from scratch. However, it does not delete any of the BIOS profiles previously saved. The clear CMOS pins are located in the bottom left of the motherboard. In our first overclocking strategy, we take advantage of unleashing the Turbo Boost 2.0 power parameters and leveraging Intel XMP 3.0. Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 technology allows the processor to run faster than its base frequency. It allows this when the processor is running below its rated power and current specification. In the real world, that essentially translates into opportunistic performance boost when the conditions are just right. The Turbo Boost algorithm works according to Intel's proprietary EWMA formula. This stands for Exponentially Weighed Moving Average. There are three parameters to consider, PL1, PL2, and Tau. Power Limit 1, or PL1, is the threshold the average power will not exceed. Historically, this has always been set equal to Intel's advertised TDP. PL1 should not be set higher than the thermal solution cooling limit. Power Limit 2, or PL2, is the maximum power the processor can use for a limited amount of time. Tau, in seconds, is the time window for calculating the average power consumption. The CPU will reduce the CPU frequency if the average power consumed is higher than PL1. Turbo Boost 2.0 technology is of course available on Raptor Lake CPUs, as it's the primary driver of performance above the base performance. Similar to Alder Lake, but different from many of the Intel Core generations before that, is that PL1 equals PL2. This differs from before, where PL1 would equal the TDP, and PL2 would range from 200 to 250 watts. This change effectively means that Intel has enabled near unlimited peak turbo by default. For the 13700K, the maximum power limit is set at 253 watts. A convenient CPU cooler tuning option on MSI motherboards allows you to unleash the Turbo Boost power limits. Set the option to water cooler and enjoy the maximum performance. Adjusting the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits is, strictly speaking, not overclocking. And that's because we are not changing any of the warranted clock frequencies or voltage or temperatures related to the base specification. Essentially, Intel provides the Turbo Boost power parameters to the motherboard vendors or system integrators to ensure that they can run the CPU at the base specification. But of course, 
higher quality motherboards or higher quality thermal solutions or better designed gaming systems can deliver peak performance well above the base performance. Note that there's also a technology called Turbo Boost Max 3.0 technology. And while it carries the same name like Turbo Boost 2.0, they're not quite the same. Turbo Boost 2.0 focuses explicitly on exploiting the available power budget to provide additional computing performance. On the other hand, Turbo Boost Max Technology 3.0 aims to exploit the natural variance in CPU core quality observed in multi-core CPUs. With Turbo Boost Max 3.0, Intel identifies the best cores in your CPU and calls those the favored cores. The favored cores are essential for two reasons. First, Intel allows for additional frequency boosts of the favored cores. On the 13700K, there are two favored P cores and no favored E cores. Both favored P cores can boost to 5.4 GHz, while the other six P cores can only boost up to 5.3 GHz. Note that the 5.4 GHz is restricted to only scenarios where two cores are active. Second, the operating system will automatically assign the most demanding workloads to these favored cores, ensuring potentially higher performance. The performance benefit of Turbo Boost Max 3.0 technology is mostly visible in single threaded workloads. And that's because there's only a couple of favored cores. Most of the time, you will not see a difference in multi-threaded workloads. Intel Extreme Memory Profile or XMP is an Intel technology that allows you to automatically overclock the system memory and benefit from the performance boost. It's essentially built on top of the JDEX specification and allows memory vendors such as G-Skill to program higher performance memory timings and memory frequencies onto the memory sticks. Intel Extreme Memory Profile 3.0 is the new XMP standard for DDR5 memory. It is primarily based on the XMP 2.0 standard for DDR4, but has additional functionality. The XMP 3.0 standard is designed with six sections. One global section describes the generic data which is used across the profiles, and the other five sections are designed for five profiles respectively. There's a lot more to learn about XMP 3.0 that is outside of the scope of this video. If you want to learn more about XMP 3.0, feel free to check out my Alder Lake launch video where I discuss it in a little bit more detail. Upon entering the BIOS, in advanced mode, click XMP Profile 1. Enter the overclocking settings menu. Ensure CPU cooler tuning is set to water cooler. Then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. As expected, since we're not increasing the frequency of the CPU cores, the performance improvement is relatively limited. That said, improving the memory performance by using XMP 3.0 does help in memory sensitive benchmark applications. We see the highest performance improvement of plus 8.06% in Geekbench 5. When running Prime 95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5090 MHz, an average CPU E core clock is 4076 MHz with 1.188 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.7 and 38.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 288.9 watts. When running Prime 95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5,287 megahertz, an average CPU E core clock is 4,190 megahertz with 1.237 volts. The average CPU temperature is 95 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.5 and 37.8 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 268.2 watts. In our second overclocking strategy, we rely on MSI's unique technology called Game Boost. Game Boost has been on MSI motherboards for quite a while and essentially allows for one click overclocking and performance boosting. We had a look at the history of MSI Game Boost technology in Scatterbencher number 31. So if you want to learn more about this MSI unique technology, feel free to check out that video.
enabling game boost on the Z690 Torpedo EKX with the Core i7-13700K lifts all turbo ratios by plus one for both P cores and E cores. In addition, it also sets an AVX negative ratio offset of minus three. This results in a maximum P core boost frequency of 5.5 gigahertz. AVX negative ratio offset essentially allows you to reduce the CPU frequency when AVX instructions are detected. This allows you to maximize the overclock in both SSE and AVX workload. AVX negative ratio offset has been on Intel CPUs for quite some time, but since Alder Lake, there has been a couple of changes to how it works. Here are the key things to know. First, on Raptor Lake, the AVX negative ratio offset is only applied to the P cores. The E core frequency is unaffected. Second, by default, the maximum ratio during an AVX workload is the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio, not the Turbo Boost 3.0 frequency. If you want an offset of zero, so an AVX workload doesn't reduce the frequency, you'll need to manually set zero. Third, the AVX negative offset is referenced against each core's maximum ratio limit since Raptor Lake supports per P core ratio control. This is important if you're using the per core ratio limit function to restrict the worst cores from boosting to the maximum frequency. Lastly, Intel has changed how it flags an AVX workload. The effect is that some light AVX workloads will no longer trigger the AVX negative offset. We can demonstrate this new behavior using Y-Cruncher. We used the Y-Cruncher component tester to test various AVX workloads on the 13700K. Four of the six pure AVX2 workloads trigger a frequency reduction when an AVX negative ratio is set. However, for the two other workloads, the frequency remains elevated. Upon entering the BIOS, in easy mode, click the Game Boost button. Click XMP Profile 1 then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. With Game Boost enabled, we increased the processor frequency slightly over the stock settings. Therefore, while we expect some performance improvement, we don't expect it to be enormous. We have the best performance improvement of plus 9.11% in Geekbench 5. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5083 MHz and average CPU E core clock is 4202 MHz with 1.188 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.7 and 38.1 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 287.8 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5,353 MHz, and average CPU E core clock is 4,256 MHz with 1.259 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.7 and 38.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 283 watts. In our third overclocking strategy, we rely on MSI's Turbo Ratio Offset feature. Turbo Ratio Offset allows us to offset the default Turbo Ratio configuration by a specific number of bits. Essentially, it allows you to set a very dynamic overclock without having to go too deep in the BIOS options. For our configuration, we choose a Turbo Ratio Offset of plus five for the P cores and plus two for the E cores. That will push the P core frequency up to 5.9 gigahertz and the E core frequency to up to 4.4 gigahertz. In addition to turbo ratio offset, we will control the voltage using adaptive voltage mode. This suits our dynamic overclock the best. In order to understand what we're setting and how we're setting it, let's have a closer look at the two Intel technologies, turbo ratios and adaptive voltage mode. Generally speaking, there are two main ways of configuring the CPU ratios on Intel CPUs, sync all cores or turbo ratios. Sync all cores sets a single fixed ratio applied to all cores. This is very much the historical or traditional way of Intel CPU overclocking. 
Turbo Ratio Configuration allows us to modify the default Intel frequency specification and configure an overclock for various scenarios. Before we go any further, there are three important things to know about Turbo Ratio Configuration. One, you can configure the maximum allowed CPU core ratio for any amount of active cores. Two, you can configure the maximum allowed CPU core ratio for a given CPU core. And three, the turbo ratio configuration for P core and E cores is independent. To explain the first point, let's take the default configuration of the 13700K. The 13700K has a total of eight P cores. Therefore, we can configure the maximum allowed P core ratio for when one P core is active, when two P cores are active, all the way up to when eight P cores are active. The standard configuration allows up to two active P cores to boost to 5.4 GHz and up to eight active P cores to boost to 5.3 GHz. In our overclock, since we lift the turbo ratios by plus five bins, the configuration allows up to two active P cores to boost to 5.9 GHz and up to eight active P cores to boost to 5.8 GHz. To explain the second point, again, let's consider the 13700K default specification. While the 13700K has eight identical P cores, two of those cores are called the favored cores. The maximum allowed frequency for the favored cores is 5.4 GHz, whereas the other cores are limited to 5.3 GHz. If we combine point one and point two, we can identify the following scenarios. If one P core is active and it is a favored P core, then that core will run at 5.4 gigahertz. If one P core is active and it is not a favored P core, then that core will run at 5.3 gigahertz. If two P cores are active and both are a favored P core, then both cores will run at 5.4 gigahertz. If two P cores are active and one of them is a favored P core while the other isn't, then one core will run at 5.4 GHz and the other will run at 5.3 GHz. If two P cores are active and neither is a favored P core, then both cores will run at 5.3 GHz. If three or more P cores are active, then any P core will run at 5.3 GHz. In our overclock, since we lift the turbo ratios by plus five bins, the configuration allows the favored P cores to boost to 5.9 GHz and the other P cores to boost to 5.8 GHz. To explain the third point, again, let's refer to the 13700K. The CPU has a total of eight P cores and eight E cores. While the P cores can boost up to 5.4 GHz, the E cores can only boost up to 4.2 GHz. The P core rules for maximum allowed frequency can also be applied to the E cores. However, with one major caveat. The E core CPU ratio can only be controlled in groups of four E cores. So for the 13700K, since it has eight E cores in total, we can configure the maximum allowed core ratio for a total of two groups of four E cores. However, we can still configure the maximum allowed frequency for one active E core up to eight active E cores. In our overclock, since we lift the turbo boost ratios by plus five bins for the P cores and plus two bins for the E cores, the configuration allows the favored P cores to boost to 5.9 gigahertz, the other P cores to boost to 5.8 gigahertz and the E cores to boost to 4.4 gigahertz. Now let's have a look at the voltage configuration. On Raptor Lake, the VCC IA voltage rail drives the voltage for the CPU cores. P core and E core and the ring. That means a single voltage is configured for all these parts of the CPU. How that voltage is configured is straightforward yet complex. There are three key aspects to understanding how voltage is configured on Intel platforms. The CPU, the motherboard design and the voltage regulator. Let's start with the CPU side of the story. An Intel CPU relies on a lot of factory fused voltage frequency curves or VF curves to dynamically manage its CPU's performance. The voltage frequency curve essentially describes the relationship between a certain operating frequency and the voltage that is required to run at that frequency stably. A lot of parts inside your CPU have a VF curve, including those relevant to the VCCIA voltage rail. 
In case of the Core i7-13700K, the VCCIA voltage rail is affected by no less than 11 different voltage frequency curves. Based on these VF curves, to get a specific voltage provided via the VCCIA voltage rail, the CPU issues an SVID request to the voltage controller. The VID request is the highest among all the requested voltages according to every VF curve affecting the voltage rail. Let's take an example. In this case, the highest voltage requested according to the relevant VF curves is 1.32 volt by P core 0. This will be the VID request from the CPU to the voltage controller. Here's another example. In this case, the highest voltage requested according to the relevant VF curves is 1.25 volt by E core group 0. This will be the SVID request to the voltage controller. The main purpose of the SVID voltage request from the CPU to the voltage regulator is to make sure that the effective voltage at the CPU die is equal to the requested voltage to the voltage controller, which usually follows the factory fused voltage frequency curve. Of course, overclockers and performance enthusiasts know that this is not always the case. And that's because there are a lot of electrical components between the voltage regulator and the CPU. Intel provides us with a couple of tools to mitigate these problems. And there's two main tools that we can be using, AC-DC load line and VRM load line. Plenty has already been said and written about the AC-DC load line, so I won't cover it in detail in this video. Basically, it boils down to this. The AC-DC load line can be configured such that it accounts for the impedance of the motherboard, which includes the VRM components, the PCB quality, the PCB layout, and so on. The impedance can significantly affect the actual voltage at the CPU die. To avoid too big of a difference between the requested and the effective voltage, we can adjust for this in the motherboard BIOS. The adjustment consists of informing the CPU of the motherboard impedance via the AC load line setting, so the CPU can request a higher voltage to the voltage regulator. For example, suppose it is known that a 1.4 volt voltage output by the voltage controller, as requested by the CPU, will result in an effective voltage of 1.35 volt at the CPU die. In that case, the AC load line can be configured such that the CPU requests 1.45 volt instead. The VRM load line determines how much the voltage increases or decreases during a transient load. Transient means when the CPU goes from idle to load or from load to idle. There are two aspects of the VRM load line that are very important to know, VDROOP and undershoot. VDROOP is the decrease in voltage when the CPU goes from idle to load. You want your CPU to be stable in all scenarios, so knowing the lowest voltage the CPU will run at stably is very important. After all, if the voltage is too low, the overclock will be unstable. Undershoot and its counterpart overshoot is a brief voltage spike that occurs when the CPU switches from idle to load or from load to idle. These spikes cannot be measured easily and usually require an expensive oscilloscope to detect. I highly recommend the Elmore Labs article titled VRM Load Line Visualized to see a great picture of undershoot and overshoot in action. While undershoot and overshoot are temporary spikes, an undershoot that's too low will also cause instability. By adjusting the VRM load line, we can mitigate both the VDROOP and undershoot. In practice, it often helps us reduce the voltage under high load, resulting in a lower temperature and possibly higher turbo boost frequency. Now that we know all this information, let's return to our core voltage and adaptive voltage mode. On Intel platforms, there are two main ways of configuring the CPU core voltage, override mode and adaptive mode. Override mode specifies a single static voltage across all ratios. It is mainly used for extreme overclocking purposes where stability at the highest frequencies is the only consideration. Adaptive mode is the standard mode of operation. In adaptive mode, the CPU relies on the VF curves to set the appropriate voltage for the VCCIA voltage rail. Both override and adaptive mode settings can be configured via the CPU registers. So, in effect, 
we control the CPU VID request to the voltage controller. This is Intel's intended way of overclocking. Of course, most voltage controllers also allow independent configuration. For example, they enable us to configure a voltage offset to the requested voltage. It is often unclear from the motherboard biases which method of setting the CPU core voltage we are using when we type in the desired voltage. For the purpose of this guide, however, let's ignore the capabilities of the voltage controllers and focus on Intel's intended way of overclocking. We can specify a voltage offset for override and adaptive modes. Of course, this doesn't make much sense for override mode. If you set 1.35 volt with a plus 50 millivolt offset, you might as well just set 1.4 volt, but it can be helpful in adaptive mode. The entire VF curve can be offset by up to 500 millivolt in both directions. As I mentioned, Intel offers great granularity for tuning the many VF curves inside the CPU. Let's forget about the e-cores and ring to keep things simple and assume a case where we set a global adaptive voltage for the CPU p-cores. Now let's dig into what happens when we set a global adaptive voltage. First, disregarding any user set global or VF point offsets, the adaptive voltage set in the BIOS is mapped against what's called the OC ratio. The OC ratio is the highest ratio configured for the CPU. When you leave everything at default, the OC ratio is determined by the default maximum turbo ratio. In the case of the 13700K, that ratio is 54x, which is the turbo boost max 3.0 frequency. In the case of the 13900K, that ratio would be 58x, which is the thermal velocity boost frequency. When you manually overclock, the OC ratio is the highest ratio you configure across all the various settings and options. Second, Specific rules govern what adaptive voltage can be set. The voltage set for a given ratio n must be higher than or equal to the voltage set for ratio n minus 1. Suppose our 13700K runs 54x at 1.3 volt. In that case, setting the adaptive voltage mapped to 54x lower than 1.3 volt is pointless. 54x will always run at 1.3 volt or higher. Usually, biases will allow you to configure lower values, however, the CPU's internal mechanisms will override your configuration if it doesn't follow the rules. The adaptive voltage configured for any ratio below the maximum default turbo ratio will be ignored. Take the example of the 13700K, which is specified to run 54x at 1.3 volt. If you try to configure all cores to 52x and set 1.4 volt, the CPU will ignore this because it has its own factory-fused target voltage for all ratios up to 54x and will use this voltage. You can only change the voltage of the OC ratio, which, as mentioned before, on the 13700K is 54x and up. For ratios between the OC ratio and the next highest factory-fused VF point, the voltage is interpolated between the set adaptive voltage and the factory-fused voltage. Returning to our example of our 13700K specified to run 54x at 1.3 volt, let's say we manually configure the OC ratio to be 58x at 1.425 volt. The target voltage for ratios 55x, 56x, and 57x will now be interpolated between 1.3 volt and 1.425 volt. So, in conclusion, the adaptive voltage set in the BIOS is mapped against the OC ratio. The OC ratio is the highest ratio configured across all of your settings, including turbo ratios, OC TVB, per core limits, and so on. The voltage for the next lower ratio is then either equal to the factory fused VF point, if it is defined by the factory, and if not, interpolated between the OC ratio and the next VF point. In Scatterbencher number 31, I covered the Alder Lake VF curve in detail. Since Raptor Lake is very similar to Alder Lake, we can use the same approach to also extract the factor fused voltage frequency curve from this Core i7-13700K. In our overclocking example, we set the adaptive voltage to 1.4 volt. As explained, the adaptive voltage is now mapped against the OC ratio, and in this OC strategy, that's 59x. 
As a result, the new voltage frequency curve looks as follows. I modified two additional settings in the BIOS for this OC strategy, disabling the voltage optimizations of thermal velocity boost and forcing the BCLK to run at exactly 100 MHz. Thermal velocity boost is an Intel technology that exploits the fact that CPUs need less voltage to run a specific frequency when the operating temperature is lower. When this setting is enabled, the CPU automatically adjusts the voltage according to the operating temperature. As we want manual control over the operating voltage to ensure stability, it's prudent to disable this function. Forcing the BCLK to run at exactly 100 MHz has nothing to do with stability or performance, it's just kind of the way I like things. Upon entering the BIOS, in advanced mode, click XMP Profile 1. Enter the overclocking settings menu. Set P-Core Ratio Apply Mode to Turbo Ratio Offset. Set P-Core Turbo Ratio Offset Value to plus 5. Set E-Core Ratio Apply Mode to Turbo Ratio Offset. Set E-Core Turbo Ratio Offset Value to plus 2. Enter the Advanced CPU Configuration submenu. Set BCLK 100 MHz Lock On to Enabled. Set TVB Voltage Optimizations to Disabled. Leave the Advanced CPU Configuration submenu. Ensure CPU Cooler Tuning is set to Water Cooler. Set CPU Core Voltage Mode to Adaptive Mode. Set CPU Core Voltage to 1.4. Then save and exit the BIOS. We re-ran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. Of course, we expected a significant performance improvement after increasing the CPU P-Core frequency by 500 MHz and the E-Core frequency by 200 MHz. And that's also what we see with the double-digit performance improvements in both single-threaded and multi-threaded benchmark applications. We see the highest performance improvement of plus 19.08% in AI benchmark. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU P core clock is 4848 MHz and the average CPU E core clock is 3849 MHz with 1.207 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.4 and 36.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 280.4 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5120 MHz and average CPU E core clock is 4027 MHz with 1.272 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.5 and 36.9 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 277.3 watts. In our fourth and final overclocking strategy, we resort to advanced manual tuning to squeeze the last bits of performance out of our CPU. We have a couple of objectives. First, we will try to get at least some of our peak cores to reach six gigahertz. Two, we will try to push at least one E-core group to a higher frequency. Three, we will optimize the all-core prime 95 settings to achieve better all-core frequency. I will try to explain how I approached each of these objectives with their BIOS configuration in detail. To push our Raptor Lake P cores a little bit higher, we will still rely on the same technology as in the previous OC strategy, the turbo ratios. However, rather than relying on the turbo ratio offset, we will manually configure our turbo ratios. And that allows us to have more than two cores boost to the highest frequency. Our manual turbo ratio configuration looks as follows. As you can see, we target the P-Cores to boost 100 MHz higher than our previous OC strategy. I hear you ask already, if you can push it to 6 GHz, why not also do it in your last strategy? Well, that's easy, because not all P-Cores can boost to 6 GHz. As it turns out, P-Core 0 is not as good as the others. So, to prevent that core from boosting to 6 GHz, we use the per p-core ratio limit function. Here we define the maximum allowed ratio for a given p-core regardless of the turbo ratio configuration. For example, let's say we have four active p-cores and one of the active p-cores is core 0. In this case, according to the turbo boost configuration, 
all peak cores can boost to 6 GHz. However, since the core zero ratio limit is 59x, only three of the four cores will run at 6 GHz, and the other core, core zero, will run at 5.9 GHz. The last topic to cover is of course the voltage for our 6 GHz P cores. In this OC strategy, we will be relying on the advanced voltage offset or VF points. Since there's quite a lot to say about the Raptor Lake VF point implementation, we'll cover it in a bit when we talk about all core Prime 95 fine tuning. Similar to the P cores, we can use a ratio limiter to only have our best E core group boost to the highest frequency. To make things very short, I add one additional step to the turbo ratio offset, allowing the E cores to run up to 4.5 GHz, and then I restrict E core group 1 to 44x. Last but not least, we dig into fine tuning for all core heavy workloads like Prime 95. Having a system that dynamically adapts to really heavy workloads, just like it adapts to really light workloads, is a crucial element of a modern dynamic overclock. And it requires several pieces to come together in harmony. These pieces include ensuring continued stability of the high frequency and high voltage for single threaded or light workloads, ensuring the frequency decreases appropriately with the increased workload, ensuring the voltage is sufficient to support the high frequency at higher workloads, and ensuring the system is also stable during transient conditions. For the first piece of the puzzle, we already have the answer. As I mentioned before, all cores of this CPU can run at 6 GHz with 1.425 volt, except for core 0. Using the per core ratio limit function, we can configure the system such that all cores will boost to 6 GHz, but limit core 0 to a maximum of 5.9 GHz. We have several tools available to address the second piece of the puzzle, reducing the frequency as the workload increases. The tools include TJ Max, Turbo Boost 2.0 Power Limits, and Turbo Ratio Configuration. T Junction Max, or TJ Max, is the maximum thermal junction temperature that the processor is allowed to run at. If the temperature exceeds TJ Max, internal thermal control mechanisms will reduce the operating frequency until the temperature is below TJ Max. The TJ Max for Raptor Lake CPUs is 100 degrees Celsius. However, it can be manually increased to 115 degrees. As the temperature increases with heavier multi-core workloads, it can be used to appropriately reduce the operating frequency. However, we prefer to allow up to the Intel default temperature limit of 100 degrees Celsius to maximize performance. Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits manage the total power used for the CPU. In practical terms, it reduces the CPU operating frequency to prevent the CPU from exceeding a specific power use. As power usage increases with heavier multi-core workloads, it can be used to appropriately reduce the operating frequency. However, since we unleash the power limits to effectively have no constraints whatsoever, this won't be particularly helpful for this OC strategy. As discussed, the Turbo Boost Ratio configuration allows us to specify a maximum CPU ratio for a given number of active cores. Therefore, we can precisely set the maximum frequency when all cores are loaded. In this case, I find that the maximum stable frequency for an all-core workload is 5.7 GHz. In an all-core heavy workload like Prime95 with AVX disabled, the maximum voltage at the maximum temperature of 100 degrees Celsius is about 1.25 volt. This is an essential input for when we get to tune the voltage frequency curve. Knowing which voltage you need for your all-core workload is great, but the difficulty comes when you have to configure or set this voltage. After all, our dynamic overclock requires a dynamic voltage and that means that we don't have precise control over which voltage is used for what frequency. On Intel platforms, there is essentially two ways to configure a dynamic voltage, adaptive voltage mode and advanced voltage offset. We can use these methods either independently or together. As I explained before, 
when we set an adaptive voltage, we map it against the OC ratio, which is the highest of all the ratios we've set. In this case, the OC ratio will be 60x. The voltage for 59x is then interpolated between the voltage mapped against the OC ratio and the next factory fused VF point, which for the 13700K is 54x. Advanced voltage offset or VF points is an extension of the adaptive voltage as it exposes some of the points on the factory fused VF curve to the end user and allows for manual adjustment of these points. The primary purpose of advanced voltage offset is to allow end users to undervolt specific parts of the CPU voltage frequency curve. In addition to undervolting, it also of course allows overvolting specific parts of the VF curve. Advanced voltage offset or VF points is commonly used in two main ways. First, you configure a positive voltage offset for the highest VF point. This helps achieve a higher single threaded boost frequency. Second, you configure a negative voltage offset for the second highest VF point. This helps achieve lower voltage for all core boost, which results in a lower temperature in all core boost and thus potentially additional overclocking headroom. On Raptor Lake, there are a total of 15 distinct voltage frequency points. However, only 11 are in use. Furthermore, some points can be copies of others. Here are the VF points of this Core i7-13700K processor. VF point 8 matches the Turbo Boost 2.0 frequency, VF point 9 matches the Turbo Boost 3.0 frequency, and VF point 11 matches the OC ratio. VF point 10 is a copy of VF point 9. Ideally, we would now adjust the VF curve with the following modifications. Offset VF points 6, 7, 8, and 9 with a negative value to undervolt the CPU. This will reduce the effective voltage when the CPU reduces the frequency in extreme workloads, resulting in a higher average frequency. Offset VF point 11 with a positive value to overvolt the CPU. This will enable additional frequency headroom, allowing us to push the CPU frequency higher in single threaded or light workloads. Note that VF points 9 and 11 mapped to ratios 54x and 60x in this OC strategy effectively control the voltage for ratios 55, 56, 57, 58 and 59x. The tricky part is that the VF curve slope as determined by those two VF points must accommodate light and heavy as well as single and multi-threaded workloads. If your single core frequency doesn't need high voltage, a too gentle slope may not be able to accommodate high frequency light multi-threaded workloads. If you need sufficient voltage for all core workloads at high frequency, then a too steep slope may set a too high voltage for the single core frequency. Lastly, unfortunately, it looks like the advanced voltage offset on Raptor Lake isn't quite super mature yet, and that can give us some problems when we are trying to use it for a daily overclock. Two issues in particular are quite annoying when it comes to Raptor Lake. First, sometimes the VF points don't work correctly in combination with 100 MHz BCLK. An easy workaround here is to have the BCLK frequency slightly lower or higher than 100 MHz. Two, sometimes not all points are exposed in the BIOS. In the example of the Z690 Torpedo EKX and the A91 Beta BIOS that I'm using in this video, only VF.11 is available. Programming VF.11 also programs VF.9 and 10 to the same value. To return to my example, I use the following advanced voltage offsets. That gives me the following very awkward voltage frequency curve. Just to clarify, the plus 100 millivolt offset for VF points 9, 10, and 11 are because I can't program them independently on this BIOS version. The minus 65 millivolt offset for VF point 8 maximizes the undervolt at 5.3 gigahertz to push the CPU as much as possible to 5.4 gigahertz in heavy all-core workloads like Prime 95. The minus 35 millivolt and minus 15 millivolt offset for VF points 7 and 6 ensures the monotonicity of the curve. 
if I didn't configure these points, the voltage for 53x would not go lower than that for 52x, which is factory fused to 1.27 volt. The last piece of the puzzle is undoubtedly the most challenging yet intangible, transient conditions. A transient condition is essentially when the CPU goes from idle to load, from load to idle, from one active core to all active cores, and so on. Essentially, a key characteristic is that the voltage and current change rapidly and suddenly. This can put a lot of stress on the electrical components, especially the VRM. As discussed, transient loads may cause undershoot and overshoot of the voltage to the CPU, which can invoke instability. However, it's not an exact science, and instability can appear unexpectedly. Therefore, it is tough to mitigate this problem apart from ensuring sufficient voltage margin to adapt to any transient condition. The primary way to mitigate transient issues includes adjusting the VRM load line. Still, you can use the AC-DC load line or change the turbo ratios to prevent big spikes. For example, while 5.7 GHz may be stable in an all-core workload, it may not be stable when coming from idle or a one-core load. Suppose neither the VRM load line nor AC-DC load line tuning helps. In that case, limiting the all-core frequency to 5.6 GHz may be required to avoid instability during transient conditions. If all this sounds difficult to tune for, it's because it is. When you're close to your best overclock, you're fighting everything. Voltages, temperatures, turbo ratios, and so on. The only way to win this fight is to keep fine tuning, keep adjusting, and choosing where you will compromise just that little bit of performance. As you'll see in my overclocking settings, I rely on an AC-DC load line setting of mode two, which differs from the default of mode one and an LLC load line of also mode two. While I can't say this is the best configuration outright for this platform, it is the best setting for my specific system and overclock configuration. Upon entering the BIOS, in advanced mode, click XMP profile one. Enter the overclocking settings menu. Set P-Core ratio apply mode to turbo ratio. Set number of P-Core of group 1 to 4. Set target P-Core turbo ratio group 1 to 60. Set number of P-Core of group 2 to 5. Set target P-Core turbo ratio group 2 to 59. Set number of P-Core of group 3 to 6. Set target P-Core turbo ratio group 3 to 58. Set number of P-Core of group 4 to 8. Set target P-Core turbo ratio group 4 to 57. Set per P-Core ratio limit to manual. Set P-Core 0 to 59. Set P-Core 1 to 7 to 60. Set E-Core ratio apply mode to turbo ratio offset. Set E-Core turbo ratio offset value to plus 3. Set per E-Core ratio limit to manual. Set E-Core 0 to 3 to 45. Set E-Core 4 to 7 to 44. Enter the advanced CPU configuration submenu. Set BCLK 100 MHz lock on to enabled. Set CPU light load to mode 2. Set TVB voltage optimizations to disabled. Leave the advanced CPU configuration submenu. Set CPU ratio offset when running AVX to minus 2. Ensure CPU cooler tuning is set to water cooler. Enter the digital power submenu. Set CPU load line calibration control to mode 2. Leave the digital power submenu. Set CPU core voltage mode to advanced offset mode VF point. Enter the advanced offset mode VF point submenu. For voltage offset when running CPU ratio X51, set voltage offset control to minus, set voltage offset target to 0.015. For voltage offset when running CPU ratio X52, set voltage offset control to minus. Set voltage offset target to 0.035. For voltage offset when running CPU ratio X53, set voltage offset control to minus. Set voltage offset target to 0.065. For voltage offset when running CPU ratio X60, set voltage offset control to plus. Set voltage offset target to 0 
then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. While we hit 6 GHz on most of the cores and saw some slight performance improvements over our turbo ratio offset OC strategy, overall it's a minor improvement. Nevertheless, we can be happy to achieve the best performance in all of our benchmarks. The highest performance improvement is an AI benchmark with plus 21.94%. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU peak clock is 5090 MHz and average CPU E core clock is 4080 MHz with 1.182 volts. The average CPU temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.2 and 38.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 255.6 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU P core clock is 5,273 MHz, an average CPU E core clock is 4,241 MHz with 1.256 volts. The average CPU temperature is 99 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.7 and 38.5 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 256.8 watts. All right, let's wrap this up. I would say that overclocking the Core i7-13700K was mostly positive, but also here and there, there's a little downside. On the positive side, the fact that we're able to overclock almost all Raptor Lake P-Cores to 6 GHz on plain water cooling, and the all-core configuration can go up to 5.7 GHz for light workloads, that's amazing. The fact that we can do it on a previous generation low-end motherboard like the Z690 Torpedo EKX, that's double amazing. In fact, I think it was kind of interesting to see that the EK light block worked so well even with Raptor Lake. I think the maximum VRM temperature in an all-core workload like Prime95 didn't even exceed 60 degrees Celsius. Triple amazing. The only downside that I have a little bit with Raptor Lake overclocking is the VF points. Uh, it seems that they're not quite mature and VF point tuning is kind of the ideal way to approach a dynamic overclock. There are 15 VF points available. Why not open some more of them so we can build our own user configured VF curve above the VF curve that is fused by the factory. But I would say that's pretty much the only downside really to Raptor Lake overclocking. Everything else is, is amazing. I'm sure that any overclocker or performance enthusiast will love squeezing more performance out of these CPUs. Anyway, that's it for this video. I want to thank you for watching and I also want to thank my patrons for the support. As per usual, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section below. I will also put up the script or a written version of this video on my blog for those people who wanna go through my BIOS settings and people who still read the internet, I guess. Um, and that's it. See you in the next one. 